All right. For those joining this live stream, this is one of a series of meetings discussing quantum computing capabilities in Wolfram language or simulation of quantum computing capabilities in Wolfram language. And let's get going. Okay, so where were we last time? So we've got, uh, did we already go over, we already went over a whole bunch of these ones, right? Is that true? Uh, yep. We, we already talked about the operations themselves um, and how we split them up into quantum matrix operations and quantum measurements. Um, but something that we were discussing last time, uh, which I implemented uh, a version of uh, for now, is uh, control flow in the quantum circuit, uh, which um, allows you to do, like, basically to condition on the results in classical registers. Uh, so if you perform a quantum measurement, you get a result back in, uh, in a classical register, and you can actually um, choose what to do in the rest of your circuit based on the result in that classical register. Uh, and so this so, is- So let me to try to understand, oh, okay, hold on. And is that what this is representing here? Uh, yep, so the, the 312 uh, is representing like the order of action of that gate. Um, like each of the like the numbers uh, are the order goes to the operation. Uh, but then if you see there's that three goes to if, and there's a statement there. Um, wow. And okay. So that was that's the the way right now. Um, and I talked to Jose, and uh, we're uh, not sure whether this is the best way to do it or uh, using. Uh, a hold form if and things like that. Um, <laughs> this is one particular instantiation that does work at the moment. Um, this seems kind of wild to me, but but let me just understand what all of this means. And, and by the way, whatever happened to getting graphic design to deal with these things? So I emailed uh, graphic design and sent them pictures uh, of the things that we, the type of things we want, um, but I have not heard back yet. So you yeah, know I, what's going on with that? We, I have created a ticket and there, I mean, it's yeah, just, think, we're waiting for assigning a designer for that. I think they are starting to, yeah. to look at this. Okay. Is it worth getting Jeremy to join us here so he knows what we're talking about? Um, we had him in some other meeting. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, well, I think they just need to study the, the, the examples that we sent them. Okay. Okay, so this circuit here this is the circuit here. Yep. So this says TL. What on earth is TL? So uh, TL, TL is Toffoli. Was, uh, was the Toffoli. There. Um, and that's a Toffoli gate is represented by, you see that that first line is, uh, there's two dots and one, uh, like a control, like the, the circle. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that basically means that, uh, like, you, it's a control control gate. Um, so you control on the first and third qubits in this case, and the result uh, goes. Okay, fine. Okay, where, okay, so that's applying a Toffoli gate. Um, it is such fun when these people, one, one knows from years ago, eventually they become mythical people with gates named after them. But anyway, but moving right along, just I can have my, my old fogey entertainment from that. Um, okay. Uh, okay. And what's this here? What, what, what's this operation here? This is three, two, one FK, a Franklin gate, another friend of mine who I saw just a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, okay. And then two measurement. So that's measuring in the X basis. Yeah. Okay. I don't understand this notation. The the X measurement arrow one, what does that mean? So there's, you see that there's a two, like a, a uh, Yeah, yeah a I understand. That, that means it's measuring. Right, right. And so two. the reason that measurement has an extra thing after that is because you need somewhere to put the measurement result. Um, in quantum computing, really, uh, you, you can't actually lo look at the state itself and look at every single component after you do stuff to it. Um, 
but you can look at measurement results. Um, and so, okay, so what, what the, but that one has nothing to do with qubit one. Is that right. True? So what that is, is there's an implicit classical register, um, huh. which, and you're saying which component of the classical register you're going to put the result okay. in. And, and this here is referring to what? To the that's saying, three. So that's saying on the third qubit, you do this whole thing, which is. Which if, operates on a classical, on classical register one. Right. So it says, uh, it says that if the result of register one is less than or equal to one, is, sorry, it's less than one, then you perform H, which is a Hadamard. Otherwise, you perform uh, a T. Yeah, gate. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. But I mean, this is basically, wow, this is so frigging weird. I mean, so what's happening here? Yeah, we've got these two different kinds of things. We've got register numbers here, and we've got qubit numbers here. Right. So basically, you could think of them as being uh, classical and quantum registers. Um, so in, in that sense, there. This isn't a whole register. There's just a qubit, whereas this is a whole register, correct? Uh, so those are the positions in the register on which you're going to act. But so wait a minute. This, this one here, you imagine there's a single classical register. So you system. could have multiple class. Let's you could imagine a multi-component classical register, and you're just choosing which component of it to put in because you could have a, a, a an operation that conditions on the results of the classical register, yeah. zero, yeah. like first and second components. Right, but unlike, I mean, what you're throwing into that. So basically, these are qubits. So you are throwing zeros and ones into these classical registers. Is that true? Yes. In general, if they're Q dits with different uh, dimension, then you might be throwing zero through K minus one or something into those classical registers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we haven't really talked about the classical register case before, have we? No, we hadn't, but uh, I, I talked about this with Jose um, uh, a decent amount because we were discussing if you wanted to implement uh, more sophisticated quantum algorithms, and in particular, if you wanted the ability to generalize to quantum neural networks, you need some way of storing classical, like the results of your measurements, um, and then acting on those in uh, like conditioned uh, okay. sense. Let's, let's take a much simpler case for a second. Let's imagine that we blew away all the quantum stuff here, okay? And what would be our version of a classical series of essentially Boolean operations that we will be doing here? So imagine, imagine these gates. And in fact, this is another question which I think we need to be able to address. I mean, so these gates, okay, if I want to just use a Toffoli gate on a pure set of zeros and ones, Okay, so it has a perfectly reasonable operation on those things. Uh, you know, if I'm determined that I'm, you know, it is a, it's at some level, it's just a, you know, reversible logic. Uh, you know, if I've got definite classical values, am I correct in saying that I have two definite classical, or let's say uh, three definite classical values, I apply this gate, I get three other definite classical values. True? Uh, yes, that's true. And I think what you're getting at here is uh, related to what was done. Um, last time I showed an example of how this package now uh, allows you to take a Boolean function and to convert that into a reversible quantum circuit. Um, I think what you're getting at is uh, basically if you want these quantum operations to act on the quantum analog of a classical system, um, so you could basically it was some functionality that will allow you to convert a bunch of classical zeros and ones into a quantum state. Yeah, but but I mean, even at the very simplest level, how would I represent? So if I've got a standard Boolean function, it's obviously not a reversible Boolean function. Right, but we uh, I talked about last time how the uh, there's a way to it's it's not in here. Um, it should be in the notebook from last time. Um, okay. But, how how did we do that? Remind me. Uh, so if you actually, if you want to just like put like a like a and b x or c or something like that, um, 
you like make a Boolean function that's A and B, X or C. And then you can do quantum circuit of, uh, and then in parentheses, sorry, in, yeah, in quotation marks, Boolean function, arrow, and this, that thing, and that should do it. What is an ancilla? So ancillas are the, uh, they're extra wired degrees of freedom that are used by the circuit um, that are not, so your input state is not the same, uh, doesn't have the same number of like, quantum objects as the number of wires in the circuit. Um, and this is a, a lot of quantum algorithms actually use ancillas. Most quantum algorithms use ancillas. Uh, they're like, places to store intermediate quantum results so so it's a wire which at the beginning i mean it's it's like one of these wires in a picture it would correspond to one of these wires going going without any specific input being given at the beginning is that right exactly. that that's exactly what it is and it's basically initialized to zero um and uh, you can think about it as being like um you take like the product state of the things that you input and all of these, you know, zero quantum states that are initialized, and then you go through the quantum circuit. And I assume that this works if I just say Boolean function, uh, you know, something like this, four inputs and so on. Um, so that doesn't work at that point yet because you, uh, so I'm not, what is the Boolean function format there? Uh, it, it's a it's a pure boolean so if i if i were to do um it's a it's a function so it, this function takes uh I, I think i can give it like that or it can take trues and falses there so at the moment uh i i don't uh handle this case but it could easily be adapted to handle okay, this fine all right, just a small thing. And, and while you're at it, you should do the cellular automaton case as well. Okay. Which is the same type of idea. You can say cellular automaton, you know, 30. And then you'd say, in that case, you would say, think, let's see. Now, then you get that. Maybe that's not such an easy case. The interesting thing about the cellular automaton case is that you can have a reversible one. So that when, so that then this triple reversibly maps to another triple here or in general you can have some function that you know reversibly maps you know of the of the of the eight possible the two to three possible configurations here we can have something which reversibly maps get what i'm saying yep um and in general one wants a function that does that okay but so what you're doing here what what I'm asking for is something where if I look at this Toffoli thing, I mean, okay, so let's imagine that I've got something like, um, you know, if I take this, uh, and then I say something like graph of that, Vertex labels are automatic. Okay, that wasn't very exciting. That's a non-reversible mapping, right? Mm -hmm. There should be a way of getting from this Toffoli thing something which corresponds to the reversible mapping that that represents even in the classical case, if I'm not mistaken. That is, given inputs like one zero zero here that gate should output something okay i i totally see what you're saying and i think it could easily be adapted to, to deal with that um okay Okay, but but so how do we get out from this, right? Like, like the problem is we don't have a good way to represent reversible classical logic. And how so, should we do that? What's that? So that's what the uh, 
so yes, as you have mentioned before, in general, uh, not all like you know classical logic functions are reversible. Um, but this, this this quantum like like circuit framework actually allows you to in in this reversible setting um, represent all of these non-reversible classical logic functions um, just with projective measurements at the end. Okay, but but there's a different thing that which we which we might want to do, which is something I hadn't really considered here, which is, you know, right now we don't have a great framework. Okay, let's talk about classical reversible logic. Okay, independent of any of the quantum stuff, right? And how we deal with that, because for example, even a sorting network, which is an example of a classical reversible system, right? We don't have a great way to deal with those. That that. They're a little bit elaborate. I mean, if I go and I find, um, for instance, uh, um, let's see, I go to demonstrations and I go find um, sorting network. Maybe we have a better example of this, but but um, okay, here we go. So these sorting networks here are. This is an inefficient way to do it, but the new format for this is so much better. Okay, so this is you see what you see what's happening here. This is well here, I'm gonna do an example here. Those represent gosh, what a mess here. Okay. Okay. So that's a sorting network, right? Classical reversible logic system. Yes? Yep. Do you understand? Right, so one of the problems with this is that every input has, every gate, in this case a transposition, has two inputs and two outputs. Right. Okay, now we don't have a great way to compose two input, two output gates. And effectively what you're defining, so, so this is, what do I end up doing here? Um, now this is probably, I, I think we have a way using a fold pair list, am I right? I'm not sure. But, but my question is, if we were going to represent two input, two output logic. So, so for instance, right now, what you're saying is, um, what you're defining here Okay, so um, Jose, are you understanding what I'm talking about here? Y yes, I think I do. I was thinking of a sequence of permutations, like yes, that would be an example, right? So, so what you're doing there is you've got, let's say, a register of length five, um, and you're asking to do permutations of. I mean, this is the sorting network is a sequence of permutations applied to particular elements. That's what those, this, that list there, the optimal sort for 15 elements, mm -hmm. that is a sequence of, of transpositions. Right. Although I am a bit confused here. So, oh, those are ones that can be done simultaneously. Right. right. Those are ones that happen to be in parallel because they affect different wires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks like a bit like a decomposition in cycles, in which each cycle is of length two. Yes. But so the question, the, the issue that we have here is, I mean, it's sort of interesting. It's sort of an interesting case that we've got functions that, okay, we've got a list and we've got functions that take, it's a little bit like block map. They take, you know, sub elements from here Essentially, we've got a thing. Okay, let's let's consider a function. Uh, I don't even know what to call it, but um, let's say, hmm, wow, what is this? This is a kind of um, block composition. I don't even know. That's not a very good name for it. But what does that mean? That means at each step, you are defining a 
set of, of elements and a function to apply to that set of elements, much like fold pair list, right? So fold pair list has the feature that it has to, what it returns always has to be a pair, if I'm not mistaken. That is that function F always returns a pair. It takes a pair and returns a pair, doesn't it? Um, yes. But here, why do we need pairs? This is more like a like a function of n to n. Exactly, exactly. It's yeah. an enary. It's a it's a. Um, uh, so what this really is is it's not really a permutation. It's really a block function composition, something like that, where it takes enary things here, and this is specifying that you take the elements. So so this is applied to ultimately to a register here or something this could be a standard composition of what roger calls transformations which are functions taking a list and returning another list like like geometric transformations yes but but it has to also say where on the register you want the thing to apply I'm but making sense. Is isn't that determined by the position of the elements in the list? No, because what this is saying is just like these ones over here, these sorting networks, that's saying that take elements 13 and 15 in the <laughs> register <laughs> and apply a transposition to them. Right. But that's because this is the expressed in a cyclic way. If we had all these multi um, permutations multiplied into a single list, the function would be a permutation itself. Sure, of the whole register. Right. And I think what is convenient is to be able to say here, I mean, if we're doing it of the whole register, we don't need a new function here. If we're doing it of the whole register, you're absolutely correct. It's purely a series of, of um, a composition of a series of, of, let's say, permutations or other reversible functions on the whole register. Right. Okay. But the <laughs> difference here, and this is what, what um, Jacob has in the quantum case, is he's got this notation that in the quantum case means apply this function, which has three inputs and three outputs, to that block. I mean, to that sequence. You see what I'm saying? I see. I see. Independently of whether there are actually 10 or, or more. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't matter how many. It's just saying yeah. take those elements yeah. and apply this essentially reversible rule. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, not reversible. It just has to be N to N. Right. Right. So it's saying apply this thing. So what mm -hmm. it really is, is it's saying we're going to have a list of what to apply you know, what to apply it to. So it's saying do that one and potentially, I mean, this is actually quite an interesting function. This this looks a bit like carry in the sense of having the function and the permutation that selects the elements. Yes, that's an interesting thought. Okay, so curry, this is some kind of weird multi-curry. Right, some sort of composition of curry, yeah. Except that it has this feature that every one is an end-to-end -end function, because otherwise you don't, otherwise it, the thing will fall apart. Right, so if those are not end-to-end, -end, well, what on earth happens? I if, see. If it, so, so you need to preserve the ones you are not mentioning. That's what you mean. Yes. I mean, in other words, what I'm saying is, you stuff back into the list at the same positions you got things from mm -hmm. the results right. of that function, right? right? It's a completely different thing if you take elements of the list and you reconstitute the list. I mean, that's what's different here. This is unique to reversible logic, basically. Right. So the difference uh, between what you're talking about and, and the quantum case is that in the quantum case, it, you, not everything is completely independent. You have entangled uh, objects. And so in that case, you can't just put the result like one quantum res the result of, of one uh, thing in another, uh, you have like these are they're like intertwined in some way. You can't like, disentangle them. Yeah, yeah, I understand. But 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 I could imagine running 
yeah, I, I understand that. But but what I'm saying is the it isn't really a limit. It's not really a classical limit. It's something different. But I could imagine take that Toffoli gate, take that Fredkin gate, and simply apply them to a classical register, right? And this notation and this diagram would perfectly well apply to a classical register. You know, okay, I see what you're saying zero, there. And it could output zero, zero, 001 or something. Yep, I, I totally see what you're saying there. Um, so then, then what we're seeing is, then the difference is, do we live in, you know, in a, in a, you know, just a bunch of vectors or in a Hilbert space? Um, you know, is there a particular input or is it a complicated, you know, uh, Hilbert space of possible possibilities? Um, so what I'm trying to do is understand the degenerated case, which is ultimately your case here, which is the classical case. Right, that that case there, albeit in a little bit of funkiness, because it's 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 connecting the quantum case to the classical case. But I'm asking, what's the pure classical case? And you're saying, um, you know, this particular thing is a one wire. And therefore, necessarily, but in principle, this could be a two-wire thing, so long as it's, if I'm not mistaken. This could perfectly well say, two, three goes to blah, blah, blah. Right? And, and this could condition. Totally, yeah. you, could, you could do that right now. You could, uh, you could put in, like, you know, one, two, three, and then put in, instead of H and T, you'd have to use like, you know, TL and FK because those are three input gates instead of one. Okay, fine. But those are the, okay, but, but we've got two pieces here. That's the quantum operation that's being done. But I'm saying also this classical operation here could also be operating on more than one wire. Correct. And I have not uh, coded that up yet. Okay. But I mean, I, I think that that classical operation also, in, in the way that you're using it here, it's a little bit different from what I'm talking about here, because really it's basically an if, you know, and then, oh boy. I mean, that one is really an element. I mean, this is really applying itself. So in a quantum circuit, we are imagining there is, in a quantum circuit, we're imagining there are two things. There's the um, quantum wires or something, quantum you know, components, plus there is some kind of classical register. Correct. Right? Um, so, and, and those operations are then Oh boy, this is so weird. Okay, so measurements go from the quantum side to the classical side. Yep. And this thing here says, let's check out the classical side and secretly do a little classical computation on the side in order to switch the quantum side. Yep. That's How does exactly. one actually do that in a in a in an actual you know, thing with, you know, with cryostats and so on? How does one do this? I, so I'm actually not sure about that. I've, I've never done any of the like, applied stuff, so. Okay, fair enough. I, I'm always a believer when I used to do particle physics, I made a point of actually going to visit the experiments because you, you just discover, but unfortunately these ones I've, I've um, you know, nobody's prepared to open their cryostat, it seems. Um, in any case. Uh, Okay, so let's come back. Okay, I think this is a mess. Okay, I think I think we need to think about this more carefully. But let's I just... totally agree that it's a mess. Um, and if we can figure out a better way to do it, I'm all game. Okay, well, I, I think what's going to happen is that if is going to turn into a, a just a, a regular pure function here. Um, but I don't think that's the end of the story. I think we need to solve this problem as well. But let's just scope out what else we're looking at here. Um, we were discussing whether to use some sort of inactive expression, because this looks a bit like um, like what anti-solve does for equations and things like that. 
I don't think it is that. I think it's a look. I think these are operations. I think these things here, in a in a in a correct world, those are are basically pure functions, right? And I think this should also be a pure function. I think the only anomaly here is that this thing, so far as I understand it, doesn't. If I apply that to actual arguments, it doesn't do anything, does it? You have to use quantum evaluate to do that because we. So the reason that we did that is because there are also properties that you can extract from quantum operations and and quantum states, and we wanted we didn't want to mix the notation. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. But then, so one meta operation here of a quantum matrix. I mean. Okay, one problem I'm having is, you know, one thing, I'm sorry, this is a thing which maybe um, Sushma could note. When we have Boolean function, we should make this work for all the named Boolean functions. Is, is, was Sushma here? I can't mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a simple thing, but that's just an obvious thing to do. Because what I can imagine is that we want a thing called reversible Boolean function. Okay, so here's a question. We have a, a, an enumeration scheme for Boolean functions. I'm pretty sure there's also an enumeration scheme for the reversible Boolean functions. But th for example, this would be um, a reversible Boolean function, which has the feature that, so unfortunately, eh, gosh, eh, there's a very yucky thing here. Okay, let me show you something yucky. So let's take, this is Boolean function seven with two inputs, okay? That gives a, so let, let's just do it with true false. Okay. That takes, is there, you know, has two arguments, right? But in this case, because what we're trying to return, what we would want this to do is to go from one zero to let's say zero one, right? Because it needs to return a multi-element object. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could call, we could have the, the parallel series of Boolean transformations. And then that imitates the geometric transformations that take lists rather than product. Yeah, okay, but I don't know whether that, I mean, it doesn't do as much good in this case here. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is really a... Well, you're saying this is essentially a reversible named function. The fact that it's Boolean... See, it's not obvious to me. So these Boolean functions here, if I say... Uh, for this Boolean function here, if I say rule plot of that Boolean function, right? I get that, which is pretty straightforward. Now for the reversible case, what I would be getting is two goes to two. Am I making sense? Two, what do you mean two number or? or yeah, I mean, I mean two, two inputs there, like one, one goes to let's say zero, one here. I see. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Now the problem is that it's not quite as obvious how you do the enumeration, because in this case, the enumeration is simply taking those bits and turning them into a number, right? Right. So it's slightly trickier to do the enumeration. And maybe, maybe there is no reasonable enumeration. And maybe instead, the only way to do it is with an explicit mapping that says, you know, one zero goes to zero one, you know, one one goes to zero zero, whatever it is, right? And that mapping has to be a permutation of the states. Get what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. And that's something that a Toffoli does. Is a permutation of the states. Right? Uh, yeah. A permutation of the of the three uh three element whatevers. Okay. So in general, yeah, right. So these what we're saying here. Yes. So I, I think what I was saying is that instead of calling them Boolean functions, if we call them Boolean transformations, then we have a we don't have to follow the fact that they have to be Barnard. No, I understand that. 
I'm not sure they need to be Boolean. I, I'm not sure we need to say that explicitly, but I mean, Boolean transformation, whatever. Okay, fine. The main thing I'm concerned about is what is this function here that does this, right? So the basic form of it is to say, these elements of this thing here, mm -hmm. take these elements and apply this function to those elements. Okay? Right. Because that is the that is kind of the analog of what's happening in the quantum case. Now it's different from okay, in the case of net graph in neural nets, we're also able to take various inputs. I mean, if if we take a typical, what's an example of something with a net graph? Uh, I don't even know. I, does this have a net graph? Um, uh, Let's just see. Anybody know? Probably nobody in this meeting knows which of these have net graphs. Um, yeah. Hold on. Okay, so here. I think Leonard should have. A Does it? It's not just a, a, no, it's just a chain. Oh, okay, you mean with the graph, okay, okay. Right. Um. I think one of these more recent ones has has a graph. Let's take a look. Apple to orange translation. Does that have a graph? Yeah, that has graphs. Okay, but they're very trivial graphs. Okay, so what do I mean here? So what I'm saying is inside one of those graphs, it's taking... Um, That's unfortunately too trivial a graph, I think. Yeah, that, that's too trivial a graph. But you, you get what I'm saying. In, in, these, in these cases, right, what's going to happen is I got to find an example with more, more graph in it. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba, what on earth has that? Gosh. No, your neural nets. Um, Oh, here's one with more more graphs. Um, the Yahoo Open NSFW model. Okay, so let's look at that graph there. What the heck? Why is that even icy? The reason that's a graph is because, yes, 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 that sub-element, uh, it's a very trivial graph. If it was a chain, it would just have one input and one output. It has two inputs there, right? Right. So the question really is, I mean, and, you know, we're going to end up with something where graphically, by the way, I mean, this type of setup that we see here is not unlike, I mean, that would be a perfectly reasonable quantum circuit with a bunch of two to two gates. Like if I'm not mistaken, controlled not as an example of such a two to two gate. Yep. Okay. So in principle, we could make a, you know, we could take the sorting network and we could make it quantum. I, I hate to say quantize it because the concept of quantizing things was always a concept, never mind. Let me not go on a, a digression here, but it's it's like always people in the early days of, you know, in, in particle physics and so on, people are like, can we quantize the such and such, which is not exactly a procedure. It means is there a reasonable way to sort of inject quantumness into this thing without having the thing become cra totally crazy? Um, and so in this case, I mean, a question would be, actually, what is the answer to that? Do you know the answer to that? In the case of a sorting network, what is the quantumness of us? I mean, how do you take a sorting network and like make it quantum? Is there a meaningful way to do that? So, I, what, how would it act on superpositions and uh, systems with entanglement and things like that? How would it be any different? I don't think it's any different. I think what it does is it sorts stuff. And my question is, but I think. If it is entangled, I think it sorts the entangled thing. And and every 
every thing in the everything in the superposition I think is sorted I think you know what I, I this is ringing a, a, a strong bell I think I once understood this um, but you get my point that you can obviously make a circuit this is a perfectly reversible transformation right represented by a perfectly nice you know you could make a unitary matrix that represents this thing the question is what is it but, but I want to come back to, okay, so just to scope this out. So, okay, so we got this. I, I just want to see what roughly what you're doing here. So this is now concatenating circuits. Oh, wow. So that has to say how to knit one circuit together with another circuit, correct? Yeah, and that's all done implicitly. As long as the circuits are of the same qubit dimension, it handles everything. Not only qubit dimension, they also have to have the same number of qubits. Uh, not exactly, because the... The, the numbers on which these things act are, in, are are actually inside the circuits. So if one has more than another, it'll just, you know, certain operations will act on like qubits further down um, in your whole entire like quantum state. Okay. But doesn't that then involve various things that implicitly have to have ancillas running around? No. Not, not really. I mean, the just, just the dimension of the quantum state that acts on the system has to be different. I'm confused. If we have one of these that has three wires and another that has five wires, and I say, do the three-wire thing first and then do the five-wire thing, what does that mean? So if you specify, if you just had the th three-wire quantum circuit, um, then you would only need a quantum state that was that had three qubits or, you know, three quantum yeah, objects. Yeah, right. um, if you had something that had five, uh, like if you had, you know, you concatenated the two circuits, now you had a circuit that acted on five qubits. So you would need a quantum state that had at least five qubits in it, and you would specify. I, I get it. But I think what that, the point I was making is that if you go three first, then five, you are implicitly, if I've understood these ancilla creatures, which just sound incredibly... Uh, fauna like um they um you know that would mean that there was there were two ancillas here in the in that three wire quantum circuit or am i wrong so i i think that there's a slight uh difference in the uh, the way that we're re referring to okay, these things i so, don't know okay so i'm confused about what these ancillas are right so ancillas are if you have another wire that is active in the computation, um, like a, a wire that's not just like like vo void. So if you just have a you know a, a five, if you have a state a quantum state that has three qubits on it, and you have a like a uh, or even even differently, if you have yeah, if you have a quantum state that has three qubits in it, and you have a quantum circuit. Uh, where certain operations have, you know, two qubits, certain operations have three, certain operations have, you know, one, whatever. Um, your, your quantum circuit can have five wires in it. It's just going to be that some wires are not active during certain operations. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But I think, uh, okay. Well, and so it's only an ancilla is only, uh, we only call something an ancilla when it directly interacts with, like there's an operation that acts on one of the ancillas and one of your qubits. Okay, fine, fine. So a non-interacting wire is not considered one of these. Exactly. Okay. So there's no ambiguity in how you add the circuits together. Concatenate them. Oh, this is cool. You've got the, the measurement distribution working. That's cool. We talked about that last time, yeah? Uh, yep, we talked about that a while ago. Um, so in this case, uh, you do need this separate symbol, um, quantum measurement distribution. Uh, but it transforms it into a data distribution, and then you can do all the cool things on it. That's quite nice. So that's then the result of a measurement, basically. Is that true? Any measurement can be represented. Any of the, the, the set of possible measurement results can be represented in this distribution. Is that true? Yes, that's true. As long as you have the measurement operator, um, like, and then you have the state that it acts on, because... The measurement itself depends on the state that you're acting on. Um, but then, then, yes, it describes the entire you know, realm of possible measurements. 
Are you, you're really trying to make a quantum neural net, aren't you? So I was just, uh, in, we talked cool. about it for, for so long. I, uh, I just wanted to show that it's possible to uh, do something like simulate nonlinearity in a quantum circuit. And so this, there's uh, still a little, for some reason, um, there's a slight bug in the actual um, circuit, like when it, you create the circuit here and try to evaluate it, but the um, it was working at one point where you can basically using the control flow that I have above um, and you know conditioning on measurement results uh, with a while loop, um, you can do things like increase the amount of nonlinearity in the circuit as you go. Um, you know this. So this uh, picture right above is from a paper that was like about quantum neurons, um, and you can see as if you do the circuit a bunch of times, you go from Q of X to, you know, Q to the, you know, N of X, and you start getting something that looks a lot like a step function. Yeah. Um, and that's very, you know, that would be very useful for quantum neural networks. If you can feed back the output, which we don't even have a way to feed back the output. I mean, we don't have a way to recirculate bits in a quantum circuit at this time. Talking about backpropagation? No, I'm, I'm talking about a nest, an analog of nest for a quantum circuit. That is, right now, and maybe one could do that explicitly, but right now, other than drawing out, you know, this thing, n times or whatever, we don't have a way to say, connect that wire back to the start. Uh, so, right now, I think that a while loop does something like that. If you look at the, um, like, the structure uh, below in the, like, the, the last section, um, so there was there is an, an error right now in generating the circuit, but if you look at the way that the quantum circuit is like all the RUS equals quantum circuit yeah. of join, um, and so that basically says you have this initial sub circuit, and then while your measurement result satisfies something, then you join the sub circuit with you know basically itself. Oh. I mean that's such a wild thing in terms of the levels of of discourse that are going on there because I mean. This concept that you can symbolically take a circuit and join it to another circuit is is at a completely different level. I mean, in other words, if we were talking about ordinary electronics, okay, and we say, oh, an operation inside this piece of electronics is to join a new copy of the circuit. It's like, that's nuts, because the actual circuit consists of pieces of copper wire and so on. And there's no... what. But isn't that the case also for these quantum circuits at this point, that these things are still, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, there isn't a known way to have a sort of virtual quantum circuit. So I, to my knowledge, that's correct. And I, I think that the actual hardware element of this would be quite difficult. Um, but, you know, I think, and that's why, um, you know, if we were trying to generalize this to, um, to have quantum evaluate work on, a, an actual quantum computer backend um, that would not accept these type of classically conditioned operations. You'd need to have a, an explicit quantum circuit um, input there. Um, but a lot of quantum algorithms, um, the majority of interesting quantum algorithms have some type of control flow in them. Um, where, so I think that those are mostly at this point, like, you know, developing. If I understand through. correctly, most of the things that people actually build are pretty feed forward type things. Right, right. Um, so this is a capability that is there, but is not uh, probably is not likely to be implemented in the near future on an actual quantum computer, but is useful for simulating quantum computing. Where by simulating, we mean you may never be able to do it in our universe, but it's still amusing to look at. I think you will be able to do it um, at some point. Well, so, so the, this, this then means that, you know, the homework has to be Basically, there are about three implementation methods for quantum computers, basically to try to understand which of them are virtualizable enough to be able to do anything that isn't, in other words, how do we represent, you know, even the very simple thing, I mean, okay, the idea that you have to explicitly join a new circuit on to get the operations done again is like, you know, reminds me of analog computers. Right. It's it's that's that's what we don't have to do in digital computers because there's purely, you know, informational stuff going on. Um but okay, Let, let's just okay, just zooming out because we're we're running out of time here and hopefully we can continue 
um, sometime soon before we've all forgotten the stuff again. Um, I mean, I think, look, m my take here, okay, I think the stuff with the classical conditioning is really messy right now. And I think it's gonna take a couple more pieces of grinding to get that into a form that makes sense. It doesn't help that it's not implementable on current quantum computers, because that means that we're kind of, what we're doing here is we're making a model of something where there isn't, you know, there's nothing we can be modeling, so to speak. We're essentially making it, I mean, it will be like us adding, okay, let me give an analogy, which is equally bizarre, okay? Let's say we decide to add to Wolfram language uh, an oracle for Turing machines, okay? Does this make any sense? We can just say, let's have a nominal function called halting Q that when given a Turing machine specification tells us whether it halts or not. Now, in our actual universe, we can never evaluate this function, except in certain cases where it so happens that we can readily verify that the Turing machine halts or that it doesn't halt. But there will certainly be, be sort of edge cases where that function is not evaluatable so far as we know in our universe. But there's nothing wrong with us symbolically, you know, giving that function. Just like, you know, we have the variable infinity that represents infinity, which we can, you know, juggle around as, as, as we please, but we can't actually instantiate in our universe. So I think that this is the same type of thing that we're talking about things where, I mean, whether there is an implementation method that allows it to be instantiated that is in, you know, where there's a conceivable implementation method, I don't don't know. Um, it worries me a little bit to be building something where, in other words, okay, the question is, were we to have a function halting Q, you know, we could certainly, you know, figure out properties of halting Q, like, you know, if there's halting Q, and, you know, does it obey the law of excluded middle and things like this? Does it, does it, you know, it, it has various, halting Q has, plenty of symbolic properties, just like infinity has symbolic properties. And my claim would be, yeah, I mean, I guess the argument has to be that this thing that we're talking about here has, in a sense, symbolic properties that apply symbolic properties in the sense that it can describe the transformation to a Hilbert space, for example, in a way that yeah, I mean, even if we can't implement it in the physical universe, at least now. Yeah, all right. I'm I'm kind of rambling to myself, but but uh, there was this. I mean, Jose, you, do you have any comments on on all of this? Um, not really at the at the level you are discussing now. Uh, okay. Um, no. The... <laughs> The, the the only thing that worries me is so many things that are here. So it's a uh, yeah, there are a lot of different tentacles. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think we're trying to make a full you know quantum computing simulation framework that you know, handles all the cases people are interested in simulating. Then we do need something like this. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I get it. I mean, I, I just. The issue is, I mean, what we're realizing is, okay, there are different kinds of things like quantum measurement distribution, things like this. Um, and it's an interesting question, whether we can simply say, whether we can have some wrapper around quantum measurement, which gives the quantum measurement distribution, that, that's a detail. Okay, the, you know, the language design thing, one language design thing that I would like to deal with is this question about these, what the heck should we call them? These end-to-end -end functions. What is an end-to-end -end function? It's not an n array function. What would it be called? It's not necessarily reversible, but it is a function whose arity, whose output arity equals its input arity. Well, given that we are, we don't want to return a sequence, the only possibility is, is, is a list to a list, I think. Yes, and, I agree. And every time we, we have tried to enter uh, multidimensional calculus, multivariate calculus, it's the, the it's what we did in coordinate chart data or geometric transformation. No, I understand. I don't have a problem with that. I'm saying here, this thing, I mean, this is like, it's almost like a sparse function composition. Is that completely crazy? 
So what I mean by that is when we have a sparse array, we're saying um, a sparse array says elements, blah, 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 are equal to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. This is saying labeling those elements, much like we do in a sparse array, apply... The, yeah, I, I see where you're going. This is a, some sort of alternative to association because association complains when it gets uh, a key that it doesn't have. So here it would be something like, like if you get something that you don't have, return it. Actually, like you know that. what? You know what? There's a, the, uh, I'm, I'm confused here. Look, look. What we need is a function, is something which simply takes, okay, this is a, uh, you are right that this is very curryistic. I mean, okay, so look, it's something like this, where the only thing it takes is something like two, three, one function, okay? And that applies to a whole long list here. And what it returns is the result, whatever, you know, uh, whatever, you know, one prime, you know, uh, to the, the result, you get, yep. you get what I'm saying? Those yep. results. Exactly. Right? So, okay, how does that relate to curry? Curry, it's not quite curry. It's, it's, it's specifying in a list. It's a, okay, <laughs> okay, let's try a different name. What about sequence apply? If I say sequence apply f comma two three one, or even this also looks a bit like replace in the sense that it's replace the list and then two three one goes to f no because you have to re re uh puff it out again because the what? result from f is itself a list and that list has to be spliced back into the original list R right but that's like replace part will not touch the things you didn't mention i understand but replace part doesn't splice back in replace part takes the part and it, it doesn't go N to N, so to speak. What this is doing is it goes to N to N, and mm -hmm. then it splices the resulting N things mm -hmm. back into the list. Yes. Yeah, so, so if we go the, via the function, it's fine. I, I was just thinking that this is not apply. No, it can't. It is not apply, yeah. It's also not really... It's some kind of... Um, gosh, what is it? It's 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 a little like this. I don't think that's quite the right name, but this is, I think, the right functionality. This is saying, mm -hmm. here's the function, and here's the positions to which it applies. I mean, uh, it's it's almost what's that? Go ahead. Something like map at. Mm. Yeah, but but map at again, returns a single thing. What this is doing is it's returning, in this case, three things, which it then, you know, replaces in this list at the correct positions. Okay. Right. So the, the other case that comes to mind is it's the cyclic notation for permutations, which also specifies the, the places it has to act and then the rest are left untouched. So you could have those cycles added plus 100, and then it would it would do nothing on the first 100 elements, and it would touch the 100, 100, 200. What does it do here? What, what, does, what does one do with this? Where the heck are there examples where it does something? Uh, well, this this is first um, explaining the, the the what it does, and then uh, in in properties and relations, I guess it, they will be used for for some operations like permutation replace. 
right? So, so you can do. you can have a. Um, oh, I see. That's a permutation. That's representing a permutation. Exactly, and then that's, for example, that one you are pointing at. It's 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 mapping three to two. But what I mean is that if that was a hundred, a hundred and three, a hundred and two, you could put a list in the first argument with two hundred elements, and it would only touch the hundred one, hundred two, hundred three. So you're saying if I do this yeah, yeah. and I put in that first element, I put range of 10, for example. Exactly. You see, it touches the first three, but not the rest. Okay. That is highly relevant. Yes. Um, we have to go to a different, I have to go to a different meeting, mm -hmm. actually. Um, we need to continue this. This is an interesting language design problem. Um, where should I save this? I guess quantum. I save this under quantum. Mm -hmm. Although this is really a slightly different thing. Um, okay, I got to go to this other meeting. Uh, hopefully we can continue this soon. And this particular language thing is, is just its own separate language design problem. Yep. Um, yep. Uh, let's see. Okay. All right, great. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you to people on the live stream.